Troposphere. Right. That's where you want to remember. Look at that. We're just plowing through all this stuff because guess what's next? So, we're going to go right? Yeah. For instance, 
it's going to have a 24 hour day at some point <coughs> because that is the way the earth is tilted. So the earth is tilted like this, Arctic is up here, sun is here, rays are hitting it right here. Oh. So you get 24 hours of darkness. Now let's say the sun is over here, the Arctic is still here, but no more sun's rays are getting to it because of the way the tilt is. Okay? But at the same time, the Antarctic is getting all of the sun's rays on December 22nd. So you'll hear that the northern hemisphere is winter right now. Summer is in the southern hemisphere right now, right? Right. That's because the southern hemisphere is tilted more towards the sun than the northern hemisphere. So the tilt of the earth is what causes seasons. Not because we're closer to the sun in the summer, because we're actually closer to the sun right now. So in summer, we're further away, but because of the tilt of the earth, we receive more sunlight. In winter, we're closer to the sun, but because of the tilt of the earth, we don't get as much sunlight. Also why we have a seven hour day on December 22nd. So right now we leave and it's dark out. <laughs> by seven o'clock anyway, so it kind of does. Um, savings time is more for farmers than for anybody else. But you do get an extra hour of drinking in the fall. So that's what it's all this. This is another example of the sun and the daylight. So Starting on March 21st, the North Pole, the sun is starting to rise finally. Hey, it's been dark for us. But the South Pole, the sun is starting to set. Hey, look, the equator has 12 hours of sunlight. December 21st. Where are we going back? No, we're going backwards. So June 21st. I don't like this diagram. Uh, June 21st, North Pole has 24 hours of daylight. Hooray. Look, the equator has 12 hours of daylight. Again, big surprise there. <laughs> South Pole has zero. And then it just keeps going. So on September 22nd, the North Pole is sun is setting, South Pole sun is rising, the equator has 12 hours of sunlight. And then December 21st, which is fast approaching, North Pole zero hours of daylight, <coughs> equator 12 hours of daylight, and South Pole has zero hours. Does this make it easier to understand that? Yeah, another Google thing that you can look up. Or Bing. I'm a big advocate of Bing. So, moving along, we're in the energy eating temperature. So 
So as you, okay, here's a really good analogy for me. Let's say I'm just kind of dragging along a normal morning, and then I drink coffee. Well, coffee's hot. All of a sudden, I'm adding heat to myself. So now I'm starting to spit a little bit faster and get a little bit crazier. I keep drinking coffee. So now I'm getting more and more heated, and I'm moving faster and faster and faster. This will lead to an increase in my heat content because right now I'm really, really hot and I've had a, a whole lot of coffee today. Like, uh, so. so I'm really energetic right now. I'm really hot and I'm really hyper. But what happens when I start to lose that energy? Well, you start to move slower. I'm going to get cold and I'm going to start shivering again. So do, what do I have to do then? Drink more coffee. But we don't, that's just an analogy for that. So as you add heat to something, it starts spinning faster, it starts moving faster. And that will lead to an increase in heat that's going to continue building. The more energy you put into something, the more energy is going to keep going. So the hotter you get something, it's going to continue getting hotter. So that's heat in a nutshell. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of material, materials, molecules, or atoms. What does that mean to you? Well, it's hard to explain. <coughs> it is, heat generally refers to the quantity of energy present, whereas the word temperature refers to the intensity or the degree of hotness. So heat is the energy, temperature is the degree. Makes sense because we say temperature and degrees, right? Moving on, see, heat is the energy that flows because of temperature differences. Heat is always transferred from warmer bodies to cooler bodies. So I know she's cold because she's always cold. So as I get closer to her, my heat is being transferred to her, no matter what, because I'm hotter than her all the time. <laughs> she would never transfer heat to me because I'm always hotter than her. <coughs> I'm always going to give her some of my heat and then keep generating my heat because I'm still moving, I'm still having energy added. Another cool analogy. So now we'll move on to conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction, so I have a pot of water boiling on the stove. This is sitting there boiling away. I grab the handle because it's an iron pot, and I burn my hand. Take my hand off, ooh, it's burned. I'm touching this metal. That's conduction. I conducted heat from the handle to my hand. Okay? Now the water inside is conducting. <coughs> so what's happening here is that at the bottom we're heating up that water. We know that heat wants to rise. So the water is coming up like this, cooling off at the top, and then rolling back down. That's convection. Hot to cold to hot. Hot to cold to hot. Convection. Radiation, I'm radiating off a lot of heat to her right now. <laughs> it's energy transferred by electromagnetic radiation. So I am a hot person and I'm just radiating heat right now. Okay? If you have a radiator at home, if your house was built in like 1930, there's a good chance you have a radiator. That's how you heat your room. That's radiating the heat out into the area, moving it up. So, <coughs> what do we know about visible light? Biv. So what does that mean? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, to go by that, right? <laughs> that is your visible light spectrum. So that's everything we can see. I see red chairs. I see a purple hoodie thing. I see another purple and other purple hoodie. Black coat, black hat, pink shirt, red shirt. These are all different wavelengths of light coming to my eyes. Well, below that, 
that we also have infrared, micro, and radio waves. So, does anybody here work in a restaurant? I do. So, in, and another way to explain this is those portable home heaters that you have, those are infrared. What that is doing is heating up that coil inside and convecting out infrared rays to you. Okay, it's not magic, it's just infrared. Infrared is obviously hotter than <coughs> Can you see an infrared ray? Not without the actual. Right, so, but to the visible eye, we can't see it, right? <coughs> so what about microwaves? Can we see microwaves? No. Are they damaging? Yes. Why? Because they will pass through your sweat and they can heat up the molecules. They make the molecules move. They don't actually cause heat. Well, the movement causes heat, right? Right. So you're speeding up the energy of the molecule. That molecule starts producing heat. <clears throat> so earlier today, somebody said, well, I'm cooking in my microwave. No, you're just vibrating your food really, really fast. Not actually cooking, you're vibrating. Right? Radio waves. So, this room is full of these right now. Of our cell phones, TV, radio, satellite, Wi-Fi. And we can't feel or see them, and they don't cause us any heat, right? So now we're back at this maximum where nothing's happening to us. But let's go below. We have ultraviolet. What is ultraviolet? And can you feel ultraviolet? Not necessarily, no. It's not in your view, right? Right, so we can't feel ultraviolet light at all. Like, it has no feeling to us, the radiation. It happens to us in the summer, mostly. For most of you, it happens in the summer. So that's how we get our sunburns. UV light comes in with its in increasing energy and smaller wavelength strikes our skin and causes us to get a sunburn. But do you actually <coughs> feel the UV light? No. If you're me, you get UV light in the winter, you get sunburns in the winter, too. <laughs> and this just happened last week, I was sunburned. Wow. So, it happens. X-rays. Do you feel an X-ray when you get an X-ray? No. No. Gamma rays, do you feel gamma rays? It's exactly. It's kind of a trick question because you can feel gamma rays, you would just be incinerated on contact. Aww. So if you remember going back to the atmosphere column, once you get above the stratosphere and the ozone layer, you're gonna get gamma rays, you're gonna not feel so good after that. So you can look at this, X-rays, ultraviolet rays can't feel, radio waves we can't feel, infrared microwaves, we can feel those that they're being forced on us, gamma rays, we can feel those. I can't explain well. why, but it is what it is. I study gamma rays, so that's kind of cool. So what's the thing that we come to radiation? We have reflection. Light bounces back from an object when it encounters the surface. Uh, the big takeaway from this is that we have a molecule up here. We have an incoming radiation, like UV, coming in at this angle. When it leaves, it's going to be at that same angle as it goes out. So it's going to be like a V. <coughs> like a V. So scattering, it produces a larger number of weaker rays that travel in different directions. So an incoming ray hits a molecule and gets scattered. So let's say it gets scattered in 10 different ways. So we have 100% coming in. If we get scattered 10 different ways, each one of those is 10% of the original ray. And you're going to see where this comes in here in a second, where the scattering is really, really bad. But do we understand the reflection and scattering? So moving on. Albedo. by the surface. So, what does that mean to you? The sun shines light, is transmitted through the atmosphere, hits the ground, and it's either absorbed in or reflected back into space. 
So right beside that diagram, you see a table showing different albedos of materials. Mm -hmm. So fresh snow has a really high albedo, and 80 to 90 percent of sunlight is reflected back up the snow and back into space. Mm -hmm. So have you ever been on a fresh snowpack and gotten a sunburn? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I have because I'm weird. <laughs> um, so that's why, because the incoming sunlight and the incoming UV rays are hitting the snow, bouncing off, hitting me on their way back out, not to mention on their way in. So I'm getting double whammy. Mm. So you can actually get sunburned a lot faster in winter than you can in summer, just because of snow. Wow. And then this just goes through and shows a thick cloud, 70 to 80 percent. And something else I want to talk about is water. So we have water, sun near horizon, and down below, water, sun near zenith. So what's happening with water when the sun is near the horizon? What's different than when it's overhead? Like let's say this is your horizon. We have the sun here, and we have the sun here. What's the difference? The angle of refraction. Right. So notice when it's on the horizon that your albedo increases. That's because the sun is just bouncing right off the water. When it's overhead, it can just drive into the water. So that's why there's a difference in albedo between those. And then you can see everything else on there. You might want to look that off and know a couple of those. Snow cloud. And it's easier to get the sun to right at in the evening. Did you hear that? Yeah. You're going to get a worse sunburn in the evening hours if you're on a lake than during the day. Unless you're me, and it's just not going to matter. <laughs> Everybody knows what the greenhouse effect is, right? Yes. You've heard about it for the past God knows how many years. A lot of you are a lot younger than me, so you grew up with this. I caused this. <laughs> I am your master. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. This is going to be your job. <laughs> so we have incoming UV radiation coming into the atmosphere. It bounces off the earth from the albedo of whatever place. And then it goes back up into the atmosphere. It's bouncing back up. But what's happening up there? What do we see in this picture? We see carbon dioxide atoms, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going on? What are those little squiggles around those? Infrared radiation. No. no. Solar. It's doing that UV radiation. Scattering. Scattering it. So, and this is below that maximum ozone layer. So what's happening to that scattered radiation? coming back to Earth. It's coming back down, right? So again, here we have this double whammy. Mm -hmm. We get the incoming radiation, this the Earth, goes out, this the atmosphere, comes right back. So you've heard of this global warming stuff that some people say isn't true? Well, here's your cause. You, we have put so much CO2 into the atmosphere that we are causing our own problems. So the good news for you is you're going to live long enough to see this, is that, what are, what are the top greenhouse gases? First, let's do this. What are the top greenhouse gases? Right. Oxygen. Oxygen is a greenhouse gas? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. What's even higher than carbon dioxide? <coughs> Nitrogen. Nitrogen. That's not a greenhouse gas. Carbon monoxide. That thing um, actually has more destructive capability than CO2. But your mind is about to be blown because the number one greenhouse gas in our atmosphere is actually water vapor. Crazy, right? Wow. So when the UV light comes in, it's water, it's scattered everywhere. It's worse than CO2. <laughs> You pass a ray through water, it just scatters everything. So water vapor is your number one culprit greenhouse gas. I'm going to show you this next slide, and it's going to tell you that CO2. Trust me when I say it's water vapor. Okay? 
Which we put on the test. test. <laughs> we'll be on your test. CO2 will be on the test. I'm not going to say for sure. I'm, okay. I'm not making your exam, so I don't know. Yeah. But when we look at this, I would say it's going to be on an exam somewhere. So what's our highest CO2? Fossil fuel use. Fossil fuel use. What is that? Undead, unloaded gasoline, diesel fuels. Coal. Different uh, coal burning at coal. <coughs> coal. I heard coal. Yes. Um, no, not coal. Hmm? Uh -huh. Crazy, right? It actually Petroleum. is mostly from vehicle use. Uh, coal puts sulfur oxide, trioxide, something like that into the atmosphere, which is actually worse than carbon dioxide. Mm. Yay. <laughs> so we should keep using electricity. So your myth about an electric car sucks. Don't buy an electric car. Okay? Well, I it's actually know. worse for the environment now for town than it's CO2. Yeah, what about a hydrogen vehicle then? Yeah, because that one's a little bit tricky because where are we gonna get hydrogen from? The ocean. The ocean. So but what do we ocean. what do we need? But wouldn't that create more water vapor though? No. <laughs> well, because we're locking the water vapor into the atmosphere. If you're burning hydrogen, it's locking into oxygen atoms from the atmosphere. You're creating a bigger problem. So yeah. you think it'll rain more? It won't rain more, it'll be more humid. Oh, okay. okay. So is hydrogen well, our answer really or no. No. do we know what our answer is? Corn or sugar? I mean, you'll never hear an environmental person say we should keep using fossil fuels because we shouldn't. But electric isn't the answer either because <clears throat> we get our electric from coal fired plants, right? Yeah. What about the nuclear fire power plants? Other than the obvious uh, hazards, <laughs> the most recently built nuclear power plant. In fact, if you don't know, have to know the name. Tell me the year. Oh, 2008. 1979. Oh. <laughs> uh, they don't approve nuclear power plants anymore, so that's not a viable option either. Well, we don't have a way to get rid of waste, so if we can't get rid of the waste, we can't make another plant. Yeah. Out the space. Right? Yeah. I don't like the nuclear I was thinking about that. But it's just not. Okay. <laughs> you think <laughs> solar energy? You know, solar energy. Uh, what about solar energy? What are your thoughts on it? How. Solar energy, there's such a big loss when you're collecting it that it's not worth it. Well, photovoltaics are on foam lands for you. Right, you have to keep replacing photovoltaics, and that's just piling in a landfill somewhere. So there is no good option. Yeah. We do have the water, actually. Uh -oh. What's something that happens every day? What's something when you go outside that you feel every day? Wind. Wind. So, what's going to be the best way to power the planet? Wind farms. Wind farms. Well. Mm -hmm. um, they last an indefinite amount of period of time. Like when you drive down 65, you see that giant wind farm, right? Yeah. Funny thing about that is, is that all that electricity they're generating is going to Michigan. Well. <laughs> you didn't even know that, right? Well, it's it crazy. Sucks. I just found that out last semester. So, I didn't know that before then. I was a little yeah. irritated with it. So, we gave tax subsidies to a company to build wind farms to send Mich Michigan uh, Fire Energy. Congratulations to Indiana. Wait, for what? Because it's cheaper. Well, I mean, like, I understand, like, the cost efficiency of wind. <coughs> Why do we send it to Michigan? For what sources do they get? All corporations. I mean, I, I don't have the <laughs> water vapor bad, we keep putting water vapor into the atmosphere, we're going to get hotter, whatever. So, isotherms. What's an isotherm? Well, it's a line that connects to points on the map that has the same.
same temperature. If you have the G102 lab, you would actually experience this already. So we can do this line that connects points on a map that have the same elevation. We can substitute that word in. So instead of plotting points on a map that have elevation, we can plot temperatures. That's when you get this beautiful map. Looks like your topo max just in the color. All, all the ranges of temperatures are in between each of those colors. So that's all an isotherm is. It's connecting points on a map of the same temperature. Why temperatures vary? The controls of temperature. So Probably land, land water, water because it reflects water. the sun. If it's directly overhead, how's the sun? Oh, then it'd be soil because soil's only like what, 13% of them? Yeah. But your land is going to reflect more sunlight, so it's technically going to be warmer than the water. Your water. Mm. Now, what does that mean? It means when our, we're on land, it's pretty hot, and when we get out into the water, it's going to be cooler. Okay, that water is absorbing more of the sun's rays and sinking it into the ocean. Whereas on land, sun's coming in, sun's bouncing, bouncing off, getting hot. Uh, with altitude, temperatures do what? Drop. Decrease as you move up. Geographic position. So if I'm close to the equator, I'm really hot, right? Because they're getting 12 hours of sunlight a day no matter what. <coughs> they're always pointed towards the sun because of the tilt of the earth. <coughs> if it's cold, it's colder because they're not getting as much sunlight, right? So geographically, if we're looking at a map like this one right here, all along the equator, it's orange. Now, this picture is from January of 1959 to 97 average. So this is the average temperature of the Earth in January. And we see that nice warm area through the middle. So geographically, all those continents are going to be warmer. As we move up to us, Asia, and Europe, you see it cools off really fast. That's because we're not getting as much of the sunlight, right? The tilt of the Earth has us away. Incoming radiation is going to be down here, where it's hot. And up here, we're not getting as much, so it's cooler. But, in July, things change. That some of the heat has moved up, as you can see. Explain the geographic locking of heat now. Do we understand that? Because I, that one's something that's hard to grasp. So, get into that. <coughs> <coughs> 452. Oh. 